We're in a series right now called, uh, all summer long we'll be in this series, and the series is called The Redeemed Life Set Free. We're doing three different parts of it. The first uh, part will be um, based on this book right here, The Pursuit of Holiness. And this is written by Jerry Bridges. We, got, we sold all the books we had last week. We got more this week. They're 10 bucks if you can afford it. And they're right out there, uh, right by the, the uh, uh, bookshelf. There's right out there. We still have some copies left. You want to follow along on the city, which is our, kind of our online community. If you don't know what that is, and hope is a place you want to make your home, and it's, not, it's a minor commitment. You just get some emails and different things, but you can learn about all the things going on at Hope right out that. There's a white computer out there. Sign up, put your email in twice. Boom, you're in. You're in the city. Uh, one of the groups on the city is called Hope Sermons, Questions, and Answers. Q&A, I think it's called. And uh, on that, I put a reading guide for how if you want to make your way through this book uh, in the same fashion, we're going to be kind of going through it. Uh, I'm not using it as a, I'm not going to uh, preach from the book, but I'm, I'm, there's some things I want to talk about that are followed along in this book. And so if you want to do that, that's on the city. And we'll spend five weeks doing that. After that, we're going to spend three weeks in, what does it mean to be a, a worshiper? What does it mean to live a life of worship? Not just coming and doing corporate worship, which is great, but what does it mean to live a life as a worshiper? Kind of a living, a, uh, developing a theology of worship that will change your life throughout all of that. And Tim's going to be actually leading us through that. I'm excited about that. And then after that, we're going to talk about liberal living. And then, oh, it's not political. I'm not talking about Democrat and Republican and all that kind of thing. I'm talking more about how do you live a life where you're just generous with your time, your talent, your ticker, and your treasure? Huh? I'll start with T. Huh? And anyway, uh, so I mean, you're just, you're, just, you're just an overabundantly giving person. We'll talk about that right in August or so. And that's kind of where, where we're headed. Um, the theme passage of this part, what we're doing tonight, the pursuit of holiness, the theme verse for that is, and it's taken from uh, Jerry Bridges, the author of this book. He picked this verse, and I couldn't agree more. It's a great verse. Is Hebrews 12, 14. Four years of seminary, I'm going to be that guy, and I have a personal translation for this. Uh, so, I mean, uh, four years of Greek, I should translate at least one verse every 15 years. I don't think I do this very often, but here's, here's how the passage reads. It reads, Pursue hard, or strive, or, or go run hard after. Okay, that's the verb. Two things. Pursue hard after peace with everyone. And second thing is holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. That's how the passage reads. Hebrews 12, verse 14. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about what does it mean to pursue holiness. Now, Hope is known, hopefully, if, if you're brand new to Hope, uh, we want to, again, welcome you here, but maybe you know anything about what we're about. Let me just tell you what, le, what at least we aim to be is in every single message, in every single song, in all that we do, we want to be about the gospel. The gospel is not just something you do to enter into the Christian life. It is the Christian life, all of it. And so we try to call ourselves a gospel-centered church or a grace-centered church. In other words, that's that everything we're about. And I got a great email this week, as well as a bunch of questions about, wait a minute now, how does those two fit together? How, how, do, you, how do you put the two together that you're all about this one thing, uh, about grace and the cross and, and Christ taking our sin and all that, and then also you're talking hard this summer for five weeks about pursuing, striving after holiness. How does that, how does that fit? And uh, I want to spend some time here. Actually, it's going to be kind of a long introduction. <laughs> I want to get to Romans chapter 6 to talk about what does it mean to battle for holiness. That's eventually where I'm going. But in order to get there, I want to talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? I know some of you, this might be a bit of a review. Hopefully, it should be a review always. And hopefully, you're never tired of hearing the gospel. But I want to walk you through, believe it or not, the first five chapters of the book of Romans. <laughs> So and you're like, whoa, that's going to take a little while. I'm going to just hit some highlights here. One of the goals of my life, uh, I'm, I'm going to be 47 this week. One of the goals of my life is to uh, preach through the book of Romans. But I want to wait until I'm 50. I don't know why. Um, I thought, 10 years ago, I thought, oh, I'll have gray hair by then. Well, that mission accomplished. Check. You know, um, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to wait and just hold this 
book that I've loved and studied for so long. And matter of fact, we take a whole week here with our interns, 40 plus hours, and we study the first eight chapters is all. Kind of verse by verse, line by line, logical thinking by logical thinking. And it, to me, it's in January. And we have it over in the fireside room where we toast the room up. It's the coldest week traditionally of the year. And we're in this fireside room studying Romans, books everywhere, theological debates going on. It is the best week of the year. It's like my own personal heaven that week. And those of you who have been through it know I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I don't know exactly what that means, but I guess kids like candy and they, and they like to take as much as they can. But that's, that's what I'm loving this thing. And I want to walk you through uh, just one book. So I'm only going to walk you through Romans and help you to understand what the gospel is. Now, I'm going to warn you, though. What I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so is the introduction. 20-minute <laughs> introduction, baby. This is great. Uh, anyway, the, when, when I walk you through that, some of you are here tonight, and your striving for holiness is actually because you want to get in favor with God. And I'm going to blow that out of the water. If your motivation for wanting to obey God is so that you will find favor with Him, uh, by the time I'm done, if I haven't blown that out of the water, I haven't done my job right, okay? So you can ask that in the Q&A if, if, if you're not getting it. So in other words, I'm actually going to make your battle for holiness harder. Thanks. Nice. Glad I came to church today, right? Okay, here we go. Let's talk about this. What is the gospel? Let's kind of talk about some different elements. We're going to start in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to pick at least something from every chapter of the book of Romans until we get to Romans 6, which is what we really want to talk about for tonight. How do you battle for holiness? All right, Romans chapter 1. A lot of people say, and I would agree, that the theme or the, the um, overall thesis statement, summary statement of the book of Romans is verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. And I, I remember as a young follower of Christ memorizing this passage. I was in a campus ministry called The Navigators, and we were known for two things. Anybody part of The Navigators? Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Navigators, yeah. You're known for two things if you're a navigator, right? One of which is called The Nevidators. You don't date anybody. <clears throat> very, very much unlike Campus Crusade for Couples. <laughs> is that outside voice? That was outside voice, wasn't it? Shoot. Okay, and the other thing is we memorize Scripture. We just were the people that like to memorize Scripture. Now, that was a good thing. And Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, I'm not going to go into explaining all what he means there about the Jew and Gentile, although in the Old Testament, there was this people unto which God called to himself called the Israel, the Jewish people. And now Paul's saying the gospel is for everybody. First for the Jew, but also for everybody who's not of a Jewish background. For in, in it, or in the gospel, the righteousness or a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the, the, and he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. Okay? Now I remember memorizing this passage. And I remember thinking about the, the first part. If, you're, if you've thought about this passage at all, you think about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So you think, all right, I'm, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. I'm actually very proud of the fact that my Savior died for me. I'm proud of Jesus. That's, that's a good thing to think about. But the, the rationale is this. Why are you not ashamed of it? Because, this grounds it, this is the thing that makes the foundation for it, what? It is the power of God for the salvation for everyone who believes. It is power. Do you think of the gospel that way? Do you think of the gospel actually as power, or do you think of it just as a, a way of thinking? Gospel means good news. This actually says that the gospel is a powerful thing. The, the, the root word there is dunamis, uh, the Greek word there, and which means dynamite, right? Here you got Wile E. Coyote. Anytime you get Wile E. Coyote around uh, dynamite, it's a bad deal. It's always going to blow up in his face. But it's a very, very powerful thing, the gospel. Okay, let's keep going. If we look down further, the next verse, he's given you the good news. Gospel means good news. For in it, the righteousness of God is going to be revealed. It's power. Now we're going to go to the bad news. He's right in verse 18 of the book of Romans, of this letter to the people of Rome who are followers of Christ. He says, the wrath of God. 
The wrath of God is being revealed, is currently being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth. You hear that? They push it down. Suppressing is an action. It's not just neglect the truth. It's suppression. They're pushing it. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what they, uh, so what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, two of them, not everything about God, but two invisible qualities, what are there? His eternal power and his divine nature. In other words, you just look at creation, nothing else, you don't have to have a Bible or anything else, just look at creation and say, there's a God who is incredibly powerful. He's divine and he's unbelievably powerful. Those two things have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that everyone, all men, all women, are without excuse. Okay? What does this say? This says that the bad news of the gospel, you'll never understand the good news of the gospel until you understand the bad news of the gospel. The bad news of the gospel is that there actually is a God, and this God has looked upon us because every one of us has, with treason, said no to God and slapped him in the face. What's the result? Wrath is the result. Now, we're going to get to the good news. Just hang with me here now. I know. It's like, man, this is getting worse. It is. The worst news in the world is there actually is a God who is going to hold you accountable for every single thing you've done. Bad news, baby. Wrath of God. So I just tried to find some artwork that depicts wrath. It's impossible to find wrath. What does wrath look like? I don't know. Uh, But it's this idea of God being completely just for every injustice ever done by any one of us towards anyone at any time. You don't, you, don't, you don't want this. Keeps going on. Paul's, Paul makes sure that everybody understands that he's not just talking about uh, just other people out there. He's talking about us. He says this in Romans chapter 3 now. I guess I did skip over Romans chapter 2. It's great stuff. Great stuff. Romans chapter 2 is great stuff. But just for the sake of time, we'll go and move to chapter 3. He gives all of these argumentations about we're all falling under sin. Every one of us has struggled with this. Every one of us has, in fact, looked at a holy God and slapped him in the face and said, I'm going my way, not yours. It's the ultimate, infinite crime of treason. He concludes here in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. He says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better than anybody else? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin, as it is written. And now he's going to do this this Bible mash, where he's going to put these six different Psalms, a verse from Ecclesiastes and a verse from Isaiah 59. He's going to put them all together. And listen to what he says. He says, there's no unrighteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Have a great day. I mean, it's just, whoa, boom, 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 boom. All these passages from the Old Testament, real quickly shot at you. And it's like, wow. And then he goes on to say this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Without going too deeply into this, the Old Testament was filled with a bunch of rules and regulations that people were to follow to be good followers of God. The law. And it says here that there are many purposes of the law, but one of which was to enter or to maintain covenant with God. And this says that if pushed on that, did anyone, was anyone able to do it? And the answer is no. He says, it says to those who are under the law, which is every one of us, he, that's what he does in chapter 2. He makes it so that every one of us are ultimately under this rules of God, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world will be held accountable to God. And that gives, that's an imagery, the imagery that's being brought up here 
is the image of a court scene. And he gives this, ex- oh, I messed up, Michael. Go back one more there, yeah. He says in verse 20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we all became conscious of sin. So there's this courtroom scene, right? And, it's, and when, the, when the courtroom scene comes out, or when the, court, the judge comes out, and, and it's your turn to have a defense for your life. And the passage says, your turn to talk, and it says, I got nothing. Okay, the, de- the defense may now speak in their defense. And you say, the whole world's silenced. I got nothing. It's, it's horrible. Now, the only way you're going to understand the good news is if you tru- truly grasp the bad news. Francis Schaeffer said it this way. If I had one hour with someone to explain the message of the gospel, I would spend 50 minutes explaining the bad news. Because you will not appreciate this until you understand the bad news. Now, verse 21 is, according to many people, uh, including Martin Luther, he had a hot dish, and he said that Romans 3, 21 through 26 is the most important passage in all of the Bible. I've once wanted to do a sermon series. In fact, I had some of the elders even say I should do this on the sweetest butts in the Bible. Because Romans 3.21 is one of the sweetest butts, B-U-T, don't misquote me, uh, in the Bible. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from law, apart from earning it, has been made known, to which the the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, that's what that phrase means, testifies. This righteousness, this this righteousness which can be given to you in order to be declared righteous on judgment day, to be found not only not guilty, but to be found innocent, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And you keep going on there, and it says, God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. Somebody got your Bibles open, it may use the word propitiation, which just means that Jesus Christ took the wrath of God for what we deserved. He presented Him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement Through faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Just let me, there's a lot here, but just let me take a second here. He's saying that what happens is, when you and I sin, God can't just go, you know what, I forgive you can't do it. He would cease to be just. Think about if your young child, say you had a young child, and someone came and kidnapped him and threatened them, scared the daylights out of them. And, and three weeks later they were returned, but they were never quite the same. And you go to the judge, and this person, they have all the evidence completely. They even have a videotape. The whole thing. And the judge were to say, you did it. Ah, eh, no big deal. You had a bad day. It's, it's no big deal. You'd be like, what? I want that clown behind bars for a long time. Because that's justice, right? God demands justice because he's fully God. But God also wants to be merciful. He also wants to, to love on you and give you what you don't deserve. And this is what's beautiful at the cross. The justice of God where he The crime has been paid for. The wrath of God is being satisfied. Happens at Christ. But also, the offering of Christ for you allows the love of God and the mercy of God. They both collide at the cross. He's just, and some of your versions say, just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Not everybody. When Jesus died, not everybody. But only those who bend their knee to Jesus. Now, did you hear what I just said? 
It's not if you're a good person. It's not if you go to church or you don't go to church. It's not if you do good deeds or you don't do good deeds. And you might be here tonight and your friend brought you and what you think in your mind is, they see something in my life and they want me to be a better person. Because you think church is about morality, about being better. Let me just tell you, if a person brought you here tonight, you're probably a better person than them already. I know them. They're kind of messed up. You're probably better. That's not what it's about. Those who have faith in Jesus, that's what it's all about. In fact, if you look at this whole chart here, it talks about what happened at the cross. What happens at the cross, there's, there's a fancy word. Don't get freaked up by the fancy word. The fancy word is imputation. In other words, when Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, their sin was imputed to me and to you all. In other words, I didn't choose to live in a fallen world, neither did you. I didn't choose to have a nature that wants to be against God. That just happened. So it seems kind of unfair. Well, if that's unfair, then this one's also unfair. <laughs> that when Christ died on the cross, he actually took my sin. He took it. And I get, this big, big, big exchange, I get his righteousness. It's a switch. Some of you, I used an analogy back when we did the gospel series this last fall of like, going through life with a white jacket. You'll be judged on judgment day on how white your jacket is. Ooh, I'm sporting a nice jacket, right? But going through life, it is messy. I mean, it is dirty. You've fallen down when they were tarring the road. There's tar on this jacket. This is not a clean jacket. And Jesus comes along. He lives a perfect life. Perfect in every way. Being fully God and fully man, follows the law of God, not only the do's, but does, it, does the does's, does, does not do the don'ts. Said that right? And, and he also, everything his father wants him to do, he does. He's got a completely clean jacket. You know what happens at the cross? When you bend your knee to Jesus Christ, he gives you his jacket. And he takes your jacket. That's what happens. That's what it, that's what it means to become a Christian. Is you now have the jacket of Jesus. Our sin goes to him. His righteousness comes to us. It's beautiful. Right? It's absolutely beautiful. Then Paul goes on, and he says, well, where then is boasting? Well, it's excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? In other words, I got here. I, I made my way to heaven because I'm a great person. No, you didn't. No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified, made right before God. You will be justified. You'll be declared not guilty. In fact, you'll be declared innocent because you're going to be judged on, get this, you're going to be judged on the life of Jesus. That's the jacket you got. Oh, you have a white jacket. A man, is, uh, a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. In other words, you cannot earn God's favor. This is what we call a no work zone, which is kind of what my office normally is. Uh, but this is a no work zone. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do. Another benefit of this whole thing, Romans chapter 5. He starts off by saying, therefore... Since we have been justified, that just means made right with God, through faith, not by doing anything, but because we just accept it, dig this now. Did I say dig this? Man, is that from the 70s? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, groovy. Um, having been justified through faith, we now have peace with God. Romans 1.18, what do you have? Wrath. Romans 5.1, what do you have? Peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. What's this? Anyone? That's world peace. Wow. Sorry. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better. Morning service said the same thing. Big groan. Yeah, visualize world peace. There it is. Um, <laughs> but you have peace with God. Do you, do you get that? I think, I think uh, and I've been a follower of Jesus uh, for 28 years. And it blows my mind that the God that I have been treasonous against and that for many years of my life without even caring 
And then for many years of my life, since the time I came to Christ at 18, now I do care, and I still struggle with it. And I will to the day I die. With that God, I have peace. That's insane. And so do you if, you're, if you've bent your knee to Jesus. What does this also lead to? Romans 5. One more about the gospel. One more. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for you because you're good looking. He didn't die for you because you're good. He didn't, anything like that. He died because he loves you that deeply. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this while we were still sinners, treasonous sinners. Face-slapping sinners, Christ died for us. Do you have any idea how much you are loved when you're at your absolute worst and God says, I love you? It's crazy. There was a campaign in 1967 put up by Halesburg Diamonds. It was one of the, uh, one of the owner's sons who'd gotten engaged. And he was so floored by the fact that somebody would actually say yes to him that he created this button that said, I am loved, just to wear. <laughs> and it took off. I mean, it took, you know, you see them all over the place now. But it's been around for, what's well, almost going on 44 years or whatever, right? And so uh, this whole idea of your love. Now, that's cool if another person loves you. I think that's great. But just think about the, your creator loves you like that. So let me summarize what the, what the message of the gospel is. All right, let me summarize this now. First off, there is a God, and there's a God who delights in showing his good news, his powerful good news, the gospel, to the world. Secondly, justification, or being right, made right before God, being heaven-bound, whatever you want to call it, being saved, whatever you want to say, and being in legal standing with God is a gift, not earned in any way whatsoever, so that the giver, God, gets the glory and we get the joy. Third thing is that upon believing, our sin is imputed to Jesus and his perfect righteousness is imputed to us. It's a switch. Now, let me give you a little gospel quiz. Here we go. This is not rhetorical. I really want to hear your answers. Number one, can you do anything to earn the righteousness of God? No. And somebody like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 really, no. Yeah, think about that. Let that soak in all the way to your toes. Second thing, can you do anything to make God love you more or less? No. While you are still sinners, that's your very worst. And sometimes I love to, when we talk about communion, Christ didn't die for the sins that you're not ashamed of. Well, he did die for those. But Christ really died. I guess he really died for everything. But he died for the yuckiest sin you can possibly think of. Thing you're most ashamed of. Maybe you never told anybody. That's who he died. And he loves you that deeply. Can you do anything to make God love you more or less? No. And third question. On judgment day, you'll be judged on the life of, fill in the answer, Jesus. In order to get entrance into heaven, you'll be judged, if you're a follower of Jesus, on the life of Jesus. This is, as we like to say in northern Minnesota, a heck of a deal, right? I used to think in my mind when I finally got this thing explained to me about what the gospel was, why would anyone not say yes to this? Well, you just don't want to follow God or there's other things in your life you'd have to give up or different things. I understand that. I was there as well. But if you really ponder this, it makes no sense to turn your back on this deal. This is a heck of a deal. Better than a two-for-one Groupon. You know what I'm saying? This is a good deal. Now, all of that, I hate to say this, all of that is introduction to this question. Is that it? Is the entirety of why we're here tonight, is why you came out to worship tonight, about a future reality, about Judgment Day? Now, if it were all there is, it'd be worth it. But is there more? Is there more to the gospel than just being becoming fit for heaven, which it is that, and again, I've, I said if it was only that, it'd be worth it. 
This happened to me when I became a follower of Christ. I got so enamored by the fact that, oh my gosh, you can know, you can know right now what will happen on that day. I, I thought, oh man, you just got to live a good life and hope that you're, hope for the best and just, you know, maybe God will ask you a question that you know the answer to. I had no idea, no idea how a person got into heaven. And so when that question was answered for me that if you have the Son of God, you have life. Simply put, John, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. If you have the Son of God, you have life. When that was put in me, I'm like, oh, that is the best news ever. But I noticed not only did I have a mindset that said, oh, I feel better, I feel great, that I know that I'm heaven bound. Not because I'm a good guy. Because Christ is a great Savior. Is, was there more though? Something happened to me. And those things that I was doing that I knew were against God no longer satisfied me. And, and I realized I had kind of a change of who I was. In fact, it was kind of irritating. Because I, I used to kind of enjoy some of these things. And they weren't bringing me enjoyment anymore. And now, I'm, I'm like, I, I want to follow God. Is there something more to the gospel? Is there something more to the gospel? And the answer to that is, yes, there is. So now, all that was introduction. Tonight I want to talk about the battle for holiness. Because if you understood everything I just said, the question that should be on your mind is the exact question that Paul asks when he writes this letter to the Romans in chapter 6. All that was introduction. Here we go. Here's the question. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? If you understand the gospel, if you understand how beautiful the message is that Christ died for sin, all of it, why wouldn't you just say, great, I can live any way I want, and it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It, it's all covered. If you aren't asking that question, you don't understand the gospel. If you don't answer that question and say, well, what's, it's not like eternal life's at stake here, so what difference does it make? If that's not something going on within you, you don't get what I said. You need to download this last 20 minutes and listen to it again. It doesn't make any difference. You can't do anything to earn the favor of God. Like I said, some of you are going, dude, that was my whole motivation. Sorry, just took it away. That's not the motivation for holiness. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That's the big question. The big answer, Paul says this, by no means. In the Greek, the word is me genoito. There's a, pa there's a uh, version of the Bible that was written by a bunch of hillbillies down south called the Cotton Patch Bible. They translate this passage, no kidding, there really is. Um, they translate this passage, and I think it's a great translation, hell no, Okay? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Hell no. It's a very emphatic. It, I think the Apostle Paul would like that translation. No way. And here's the reason. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? It doesn't satisfy you anymore. The big answer is no. You can't live that way. Really? Well, I thought I could because I'm free. Yes, you are free, but you're not free to go and sin. You're free to now not sin. Before you weren't. You were a slave to sin. But now you're free. So you're saying, wait a minute now. So I do have to pursue holiness. Yes, you do. Well, but I thought I can't earn anything. No, you don't. Yeah, I know. It's, it's complicated. Here's the way the reformer said it. John Calvin is one who, who said it this way. He said, justification is by faith alone. In other words, your faith, being fit for heaven is by faith, trusting in Christ. It's an instantaneous thing, completely free. But the faith that justifies is never alone. It's followed by striving and effort to know God. But it, those don't gain you any points, okay? And that's the, one of the big points of battle for holiness, is if you start to go and say, I'm going to battle for holiness. Pick an area of your life. Lying. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be truthful. I'm going to say the truth in love. I'm not just going to beat people over the head with it. I'm going to say truth. And I'm just going to go after this. And then God will really love me. 
because I really hate myself when I lie, and so God must think that way about me. And so even though I've trusted Christ, I'm now I'm not going to lie anymore, and so therefore God will love me. Now I just took that away, and I said, no, God already loves you. God already forgives you. Great. Well, now, why shouldn't I lie? See the problem? Let's see what Paul says. Or no, no, excuse me. Let me quote this thing first from, from the book. I want to have a few quotes from the book. And he, he talks about this. Um, he talks about why is it that the one was instantaneous and the other one isn't. In other words, why is justification, I'm, I'm right before God, I'm fit for heaven. That's instantaneous. It's a free gift. And the other one isn't. And he gives a great analogy here. He says, but if we have been delivered from this realm, why do we still sin? Though God has delivered us from the reign of sin, our sinful natures still reside within us. I would go so far as to say that for many of us, you don't even, you didn't really wrestle with sin at all until you trusted Christ. And then you trust Christ and it's like, I almost swore there. Holy cow. (laughs) And and, uh, and now, see, struggle with swearing. So, I've got to pursue holiness here. That, it's like, this is really hard. I thought it was easy. Even though sin's dominion and rule are broken, the remaining sin that dwells in believers exerts a tremendous power, constantly working toward evil. And here is his great illustration. He says, an illustration from warfare can help us see how this is true. In a particular nation, so he's just making up this story. There's a, there's a nation, and he says, two competing factions were fighting for control of the country. Eventually, with the help of an outside army. One faction won the war and assumed control of the nation's government. But the losing side did not stop fighting. They simply changed their tactics to guerrilla warfare and continued to fight. In fact, they were so successful that the country supplying the outside help could not withdraw its troops. So what's going on? That's what you're in right now. If you're a follower of Jesus, The war has been won. Boom! Good Friday. Resurrection Sunday. Easter Sunday. It's over. The war is done. But sin and Satan and all his dominions, they're not giving up. They're fighting guerrilla tactics now. They know they've lost, but they're still taking shots. And as soon as you decide, like last week, we talked about drawing a line and saying, I'm going to cross that line. I'm going to pursue holiness. When you cross that line, you're going to experience more warfare and more attacks from the enemy. And they're they're not going to be fair shots. All kinds of horrible things are going to come to you. What does Paul say is is our source of strength for this? It's by the fact that we are unified with Jesus. Romans 6, 3. Keep going on in Romans 6. He says, how can we, uh, uh, by no means we died to sin, how can we live it any longer? Next verse, or don't you know, verse 3, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been uh, united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin, right? You're not going to struggle with sin anymore when you're dead. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives... He lives to God. What happens when you become a follower of Jesus is this. You become unified with Christ. And to use an analogy, and Paul even used this in Romans chapter 7, is it's like marriage. You, you tie together all of your assets, and you're unified together. And you're unified with Jesus. How unified are you? Well, so unified that in a real way, when he died on the cross, so did you if you're a follower of Christ. In a real way... When he raised from the dead, so did you. And Paul uses the imagery of baptism. All right, let's, I know there's a whole bunch of views of baptism in the room, uh, and I understand that. Let me just be sensitive to that. My, my point is to not raise all of that up right now. 
Uh, another time I'm happy to do that, but not right now. The, the point is, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees, no matter where you're coming on the idea of Christian baptism, that baptism symbolizes union with Christ. That's what it symbolizes. Even for people who sprinkle. They, they, you read them. They, they all say it. it's about union with Christ. That's what it means. We're unified with Jesus. Okay, now we practice what we call believer baptism, a person after they come to faith. So it doesn't do anything to you. It doesn't, it is not hocus pocus, nothing. It's just a symbol. And it's a way of publicly declaring that you're in Christ. And what the, a symbolism is, that's why we dunk you, is because you are like you're dead before, or excuse me, your life before Christ, and then you go into the water, which implies death. Under the water, you're dead. And you died with Christ, and then you come up again, unless you get baptized by somebody who has a death wish for you. They bring you up. And that implies newness of life. You actually are now new. Now, not by the act. Okay, the baptism, it's a symbol, and you got wet. That's it, okay? But it's a symbol that says, I'm unified with Jesus. That's why we baptize the way we do, because you're saying, I'm like that. This is my favorite baptism in the history of hope. And I apologize for many of you in the room. I know I baptized you. But, but uh, this was the best. Chris Anderson sat right there. And uh, this is back when we used to have people come up and they share a little story about themselves. Chris walked up here fully clothed, had a jacket on, the whole, whole thing. Walks right up here, shares his story, walks back to the tank in all of his clothes. Boop, goes down. I mean, just soaked through, obviously. And he goes back and he sits right there. It's why those seats... <laughs> are still wet to this day. In 2004, he did this. And it was just so Chris Anderson, if you know him. No towel, no nothing. He just went and sat. And that's what Paul is saying is, your source for battle how you, is because you're in Jesus. Now he's going to explain that. And I, what I want to do here is break it down to three things that result because of your unifying with Jesus. Okay, three things. The battle for holiness. Here we go. This battle that you are in, if you are a follower of Christ and you want to go after him, not because you have to, but because you get to. And because sin no longer satisfies and because you've been set free from sin, now you can follow after God. This battle is epic. Okay? This is as epic as Jack versus Chuck. That is a website. Jackversuschuck.com. I kid you not. I got this, uh, not many is going to understand it, but I got a note put on my coffee cup this morning. In an epic battle of Jack versus Chuck, MacGyver would win. That's what they said. I don't, I thought that was kind of funny, actually. Uh, anyway, I want to talk about this. I want to I go through the rest of the passage with you all. And there's just, there's just uh, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, four more verses. And I want to pick three things. And just to arm you for this battle. This battle for holiness that you're going to go through if you want to follow after Christ. You want to be like your dad. You want to have, I want to be like him. What does that look like? Number one, verse 11. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So there's something, what he's saying here is reckon or count yourself, two things, dead to sin, I'm dead to that. And alive to God in Christ Jesus. In, in the, uh, the, the book here, uh, Pursuit of Holiness, uh, he says it this way. He says, how do we overcome things? He says, to do it, we must form the habit of continually realizing that we are dead to sin and alive to God. You've got to get that habit going. Practically speaking, we do this when, by faith in God's word, we resist sin's advances and temptation. We count on the fact that we are alive to God when by faith we look to Christ for the power we need to do the resisting. Faith, however, must always be based on fact. And Romans 6.11 is a fact for us. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Now, it's a mind thing. It's a mind thing. He's saying... Think of it this way, because that ain't the way you're going to feel. The enemy is going to go right after your affections and your appetites and your longings and your insecurities. 
somewhat after your rationale, but your rationale, you can, you can fight this with. And it says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to righteousness. Second thing, don't let sin reign. Fight it. Don't let it rain. Second, ver, uh, verse 12, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. Why? Because it wants to. And now you're going back to that war analogy. It's the old ruler. It's the old king of the, of the region. They're defeated. And yet they're wooing you and beckoning you. Come, follow me. Follow me the way you used to. Come on, come on, come on. Again, I want to quote from this book, and he talks about why that is. Why am I struggling with this, even though I'm a different person now? He says, suppose, for example, I had a lame leg, and as a result, developed a limp. If through surgery my lameness is cured, I would still tend to limp out of habit. Or do you suppose that when slaves were freed from, uh, by President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, they immediately began to think as free men? Undoubtedly... They still tended to act as slaves because they had developed habit patterns of slavery. In a similar manner, Christians tend to sin out of habit. It is our habit to look out for ourselves instead of others, to, to retaliate when injured in some way, and to indulge the appetites of our bodies. It is our habit to live for ourselves and not for God. When we become Christians, we do not drop all, the, these, all of this overnight. In fact, we'll spend the rest of our lives putting off these habits, and putting on habits of holiness. That's going to be one of the messages in this series a couple weeks out now. Habits of holiness. How do you develop that? So now you've got a different pattern and the ways it satisfies versus these old habits. Third thing. First thing was, count yourselves. Think of yourselves. I'm dead to this. It doesn't have authority over me. It feels strong. My affections are coming up. But no, I'm dead to that, and I'm alive to God. God, you're the one who gives me life. Second thing is don't let it. Resist it. Stand fast. Don't effort. Lots of effort. Don't let it rain. Third thing, offer yourselves to God. But rather, instead of that, instead of offering yourselves to that, offer yourselves to God and those who've been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because... You are not under law. Hear that? You're not under law. You don't have to do this. You get to now. You're under grace. What happens? There's a new nature within you. The Holy Spirit has come into your life, if you're a follower of Jesus, and has given you a new nature. You've been brought from death to life. You're a different person. And He's working in your life. You need to follow Him. But it is going to take effort to not... Go after the, the habits that you had. Talked about it this way in saying that it is instantaneous that you're justified. You're right before God. It's a lifetime for you to be sanctified, for you to follow after Him. And in that sanctification process, part of your enemy is your own flesh. Part of your enemy is there's no redemption plan for the flesh. You just got to beat it. It's going to want to go different ways. And you say, no. You're going to go this way. I like what J.C. Ryle has said. He's a pastor of the uh, 1700s. He said it this way. He says that faith in Christ is the root of all holiness. That the first step towards a holy life is to believe on Christ. That until we believe, we have not a jot of holiness. That union with Christ by faith is the secret of both beginning to be holy and continuing to be holy. That the life that we live in the flesh, we must live by the faith in, of the Son of God. That faith purifies the heart. That faith in the, uh, is the victory that overcomes the world. That by faith, the elders obtained a good report. All these are truths which no well-instructed Christian will ever think of denying. But, surely the Scriptures teach us that in following holiness, the true Christian needs personal exertion. And work as well as faith. I would actually say that your faith spawns on this exertion. The very same apostle who says in one place, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. 
says in another place, I fight, I run, I keep under my body, or I beat my body, another translation. And in other places, let us cleanse ourselves, let us labor, let us lay aside every weight, quoting from Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians and Hebrews. Moreover, the scripture nowhere teach us, uh, no, scriptures nowhere teach us that faith sanctifies us in the same sense and in the same manner, that faith justifies us. Justifying faith is a grace that works not, but simply trusts, rests, and leans on Christ, from Romans 4. Sanctifying faith, that pursuit of holiness, is a grace of which the very life is action. It works by love, and like a mainspring, moves the whole inward man, Galatians 5, 6. It is going to take effort. Faithful effort, trust in what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. All right. With all that said, boy, did I raise a can of worms up. Let's open it up for some questions, and then I'll close with some uh, final applications for you. Any questions? Here we go. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, he wrote it down. Man. Yes, sir. Wow. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a best shot at this. This is like, uh, you know, you're going into a land called epistemology, which means how do I know anything, right? right. Yeah. yeah I, can't, I can't answer that here in the, the four hours we have left. Um, <clears throat> but simply put, I think uh, that you do know things. Like, you, I'm assuming you came from an okay family, right? No? Bad example? Um, uh, now it's ruined my thing. Uh, uh, I, I came in okay. I can, if someone were to ask me, I, if, I, if someone asked me, do you know your mother loves you? I would say, yes. And they'd say, prove it. Hard to prove, right? I mean, I could show her she does these things for me, but, but I know I'm. Yep. Faith is a knowing, and faith is a trusting. I trust you. I get you. I get you. How do you get that? Yeah. 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 Um, and this is a great question, and probably I should chat with you a little bit afterwards too, but in other words, how do you get faith? If faith, justification is by faith, how do you get it? Well, I'm a Calvinist, okay, so I believe that God opens your eyes and he gives it to you. There, take that. <laughs> I win. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Well, it is to me, and that's the way I understand it, is that God actually opens your eyes to see the excellency of who he is, and therefore you go, Wow. Conversion to me, the way I understand conversion is, I see all of the world, God opens my eyes to see everything, and what, what, what I understand, irresistible grace of the Calvinist system to mean, is that of out of the whole world, I choose him. I freely, I know that's a weird word for a Calvinist to say, but I freely choose him, because he's the best. He's opened my eyes to see it. But if he doesn't open my eyes, I'd never see it. Okay? And that's where... You know, that's, boy, I just opened another big can of worms, but that, that's a great system. Yeah, okay, it's great, great, great stuff. Whew, good stuff. Yeah. Right, right. So what, if, I, if I, when I restate your question, if I didn't get it right, um, that's just because I, it's the one I can answer. No, correct me if I, 
if I got it wrong. You're saying, so you, in, the, in the Old Testament or whatever, you have these rules. Don't eat, don't eat from the fruit of the tree uh, in the garden. And there's a rule. They only had one rule, and they blew it. But anyway, okay. And then we get the Ten Commandments, and we get a whole bunch of other laws. Not just the Ten Commandments, but other laws like that. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, that didn't work. Let's try a plan B, and let's have uh, the Savior, who is both fully man and fully God, let's have him come and die, so then we don't have to worry about the rules thing anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. So when Jesus comes, grace is now introduced. Do you not understand something, though? Grace is not introduced to everybody. Grace is only introduced to those who are, follow him. Everybody else lives as if you were in the Old Testament. You're, everybody else who's not a follower of Jesus lives under the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant says, do this and you'll live. Leviticus 18. Implied, don't do it and you die. Everybody under the earth lives that way. Until you come to Christ. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 3. Uh, and he talks about how cool it is. And he says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. In other words, I'm getting it from God. All right? So it never changed, actually. It's the same system. It's just at the cross, those who have chosen to follow Christ now are in, under, under a new system. So it's always still the same system. And in fact, the way it works is that Jesus completely fulfilled the law. He had to actually live a perfect life. He couldn't have just come and died as a baby. He had to follow... I don't know how long, you know, that's a hard question to answer, but he had to live a perfect life so he'd have something to exchange with us. It, you're asking a great question about how law and gospel put together, and boy, did I answer that very little, but that's the basic answer is that everybody else still lives that way. There is no change until you follow Christ. That's what good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh. That's good. I, I would say that your action, your, oh, let me repeat the question, I think. And let me just make sure I, I'll say it shortly. Is that, okay, so you've, you've, come, you've come to know Christ and you're following him for a long period of time. What happens when it becomes rote and it becomes habits versus it's no longer your first love? And I got bad news for you. That's called sin. And so now you're back into sin. Do you actually know you can do good things and it's sin? You can do good things and they become an idol of your heart. See, an idol is really nothing more than a good thing that becomes a god to you and then it becomes a very bad thing. Marriage is a great one. Well, if I get married, that'll, if I get married, that'll solve all my problems. Shaw, now every day I have a person who I will think about, thank you for laughing, by the way, uh, will, will think about if I should let them fill me up, I'll be my God. I'll worship you. Just make me feel good. Marriage? Didn't God create me? It's a beautiful thing. It's not good the man to be alone, right? Just spent 13 weeks in the Song of Solomon. It's a beautiful thing. Sin is tricky. Sin is deceptive. You know what else the problem is? I'm making it worse tonight. That's all I'm doing. The other problem is I don't have good eyesight. Every time I look at myself, it's like looking in a circus mirror. You know, one of those, that's how I see me. And I think, hey, I'm doing great. I mean, I see, I look in the mirror, and I see a guy who's 6'4", 175 pounds, you know? Talk about circus mirror, right? <laughs> so here's the problem. It's very deceptive. I, my heart is always wanting to go, or my, my flesh is always wanting to go towards sin and make idols. And I got an enemy who wants to come and wants to help me along that way. And so... It's complicated. Fighting sin is a daily battle. To struggle, pursuing holiness means not only do I just repent of not lying, I got to repent of why am I not lying? Oh, because I wanted myself to be my own functional savior. 
Well, that's beautiful. Now I got to repent of lying and idolatry. This is great. It's getting worse. And the, the whole, here's the deal on it, though. What do we have? We have union with Christ. And I also believe, and the older I get, the more charismatic I get. We have the Holy Spirit. And he will guide you. And he will tell you, you're not done with that. Lying wasn't the problem. It's part of the problem. Don't keep lying. But there's more to it. You're lying because you need people to like you. Why? Well, because when I was young, I was hurt in a situation, and I decided that I would never let myself be hurt like that again because when I feel that way, I, I, I now feel less than other people. Why? And I just keep thinking about this. And what is it, God, that I ultimately need to repent of? God, the only one that matters is an audience of one. You're the only thing that matters. Whatever else people think, it really hurts, but I'm going to let it go. And that's ultimately repentance. So when you get a habit of holiness, and it doesn't imply that whole string of repentance, it's not really a holiness thing. It's just so you feel good about yourself. And you really, if you look at a football field, you're only doing about three to five yards of holiness there. And you think you look good. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't da 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 But you're only, you got 95 more yards of holiness because you're not really repentant of the wickedness of your heart. Not, not just, I'm not looking at you. I'm not trying to say that about you, but, you know. Anybody else want to ask a question after? Yeah, way back there. We sang a song about that. He says, after you die, I'm just going to comment on this, right? After you die, you no longer are susceptible to, to sin. Why? Uh, was that Timur, where are you? Timur here? There you are. Uh, is that a Newton song? <laughs> it's like the Wizard of Oz back there, you know? Don't look at the man behind the door. Uh, is, that a, is that an Isaac Newton song, Absent from Flesh? I, Isaac Watts, excuse me. Okay, Absent from Flesh, right? So your flesh will be gone. And, and you, when your flesh is gone, you're going to be freed. Oh, because the flesh is what is susceptible to sin now. That part of you, your, your, the real nature, the, the, the born again, the re, regenerate, regenerated, re, what's it, regenerated, excuse me. Uh, I'll just make up words if I don't know what they are. Uh, that part of you will be set free now because the flesh will be dead. Okay, that's not your question, but okay, go ahead. Angels were capable of sin. I, I didn't hear the last one. How can we die and what? No? Right? You won't. Because uh, it wouldn't be much of a heaven, right? There won't be temptation. Because um, that would not be any kind of heaven. So it happened to angels. It also happened to Adam and Eve, right? They, didn't ha they weren't fallen yet, and yet they fell to temptation. So there will be no temptation. There will be no opportunity, because that would not be any kind of heaven, because every day you'd just be like freaking out, you know. Where's the tree I'm not supposed to eat of, you know? <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it's just gone. And uh, if you, it's interesting, because the Bible has a lot of figurative language about heaven, but Revelation 21 and 22, very, 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 very uh, figurative, but beautiful. No longer will there be any curse. God himself will be with you and be your God. There won't be this separation any longer and things like that. So that's a great question, but I hate to just say it won't be, but it just won't be. I mean, so, okay. If there's more questions, we can, we can uh, I'll, I'll be happy to stick around afterwards, and it's great stuff. And it is. As you're battling this thing, all of these questions are very much reality. I don't know if I answered anybody's question well, but these are realities that you go through. And it is a battle, and it's a lifelong battle. So let me close by asking you this. The gospel application is simply this. Will you fight? Will you fight? And some of you, even tonight, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right where, you're, right where you are. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's something he's bringing to your mind. For some of you, for the first time in your life, you, didn't, you realized that what it means to be a Christian is not about being a good person. It's about being a truster, having faith in Christ. And I trust the Holy Spirit that even tonight he's opening somebody's eyes here in this room to say, tonight, man, tonight I'm going to trust Christ right here, right now. 
You can do that right where you're seated. Just say to Christ, Christ, I need you. I want you to be my Savior. Take my sin. I give you my life. Some of you in the room maybe did that years ago. And the Holy Spirit is pushing just one or two things. If you're getting ten things, that's the enemy of your souls, by the way. If one or two things are hitting you tonight, that's the Holy Spirit. And He's wooing you. He's drawing you. Saying, count yourself as dead to sin. Don't offer yourselves to that sin. Why? Because there's no life there. It's a lie. Come this way, child. Follow me. And tonight I'm asking you to fight. Tonight I'm asking you to say, I will do that, God. I will go from here, and I will go here and offer myself to you. We're going to have two songs in closing. It's a time for you to do business with God. And when you feel ready, you've done some business with God, come forward. I guess we have a table back there tonight as well. You can come forward and take communion. The, the bread signifies Christ's body, and the cup signifies his blood. Shed for you. And use this as an opportunity to say, I'm counting myself dead to sin. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to offer the parts of my body as sin. I'm going to offer myself to you, God. Use this table as an opportunity to cross over on that line. We practice open communion. You don't need to be a member of a church. This can be the first church you've ever walked into in your life. Just that you're a follower of Jesus. Just that you're a follower of Jesus. And if that's the case, even tonight, for the first time, you can come forward or go in the back there at that table and take communion. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for tonight. It's just been a great, for me, to think through the gospel and the gospel implications of what it means to pursue.